I think that's good. My name is Curtis Peterson. I'm the Senior Vice President of Global Cloud Operations for RingCentral. RingCentral is a global company supplying business communication services in 41 plus countries around the world. Uh, we are the single largest pure play vendor in that space. I am done with my ad at this point, so anything else will be at the end or you can follow up with my company who does that side of the business. What I want to talk to you today about is how much corporate communications has been left out of our current data set that we use to manage our businesses and what the opportunities in there lie. So we all know that where we work, how many devices we have, all the ways we communicate have greatly expanded. You know, it was just a few years ago, short 10, 15 years ago, to call your boss or to call a colleague, you went to your desk, you picked up this little receiver thing, and you would push in a number, and, and, and that was pretty much the only way you would talk. A lot of companies even had phones internally that would only talk to each other inside the business. You couldn't get an outside line unless you had a special privilege or something along those lines. And then this little thing came out, right? Okay, so how many people in the audience refuse to carry a smartphone or a tablet of any kind? Of course not, you'd be unemployed. That's a crazy question, right? So we know these devices are pervasive and they're gonna be around in a lot of ways. What we haven't really talked about is how many modes of communication are going on in the world today. So how many people recognize almost all of those logos on the screen? It's okay, I know. Good, about 80% of you. The rest, we can talk about it right after, the, right after the presentation. This is what you do in your personal life today. This is how we communicate now the good news is in your personal life, you maintain five to 10 close relationships and approximately total of about 25 in your outer circle. There's a whole set of research around this called Dunbar's number. If you aren't familiar with it, please go read about it. It's really fascinating. Now what happens is in, in your personal life, that's okay, because that's how much information your brain can handle. You can keep track of those relationships. You know who's doing what, what you said to one person, what you didn't say to another. That doesn't have to be nefarious. That could be I've invited Sally, but I haven't invited Jill yet. This is not uh, complicated stuff, but this is how we work our personal lives, right? Do you think a whole lot in your personal life when you're switching between Facebook and Twitter or anything else like that, if you're Instagram or things like that? It's just there, right? And, you post your picture, that's the camera you use. You got your favorite filter, makes you look good in the morning, right? Everybody doesn't? I'm the only one that does that? Okay, that's out of change. So all of these modes are how our generation and younger are starting to communicate with each other. This is how they also want to talk to businesses. And by talk, I don't mean necessarily talk anymore. It could be literally I'm on Twitter and I've missed, you know, I've missed my train. I need a new ticket right now. I need to be rebooked. And going to a queue or going to a machine or, or God forbid the old way of picking up a phone and dialing a phone number just seems antiquated in today's world. But in the workplace, you don't have five close friends. I'll tell you, you have zero, right? <laughs> Maybe a couple nearby. You don't have 15 or 20 acquaintances. The average person in a job in a knowledge worker place has inside and outside the business around 400 people that they interact with on an annual basis, around 2,500 in a typical career span at a job. Do you remember everybody in your LinkedIn profile right now? Could you list it? Of course not. We can't think of that way. So, how we manage this information and how we deal with this information has to be different than it was before. Okay, 
How many people have held a extremely important voice conversation or a video meeting in the last six months where a key decision was made, players spoke up and made some kind of comment around where we're going, the direction of the business, we did a design, we did anything that was important, things that you had to take notes out of and do other information on. We got hands on that? About half, a little more than half the group here, great. So the problem with that is it's gone. You end that video conference and that information is gone. It's up to someone to memorialize that. And then what happens to the record later when somebody goes, well, I wasn't in that meeting. How did you get to that decision? Where did you draw that conclusion? How did you arrive on that design? What was the end state of the people you were working with on the other end? Were they happy with the outcome of that? Were they okay? Was it a bad meeting? Did people walk out? Were people engaged? So really when we talk about exposing what's in media today, there is so much information in the chats, collaboration, voice communications and video communications and video and screen sharing that is only temporal today. It's only there while you're in it and then it's gone. Well, we don't have to live that way anymore, right? We're standing right in the middle of the big data conference. Let's store some stuff. Let's do some analytics. Let's expose some information there, right? There's lots of stuff in here. Lots of information in, in, in messaging and video meetings and, and voice calling, customer engagement. I won't go through all of them, but I'll, I'll just take kind of this journey here is that you've got to look at not just all the information. I'm sitting here talking to you today and I will use the words and, the, is, unfortunately, probably so, even though I don't like the word, um, probably around 300 to 400 times every five minutes. 150 words per minute, normal human speech. That's a lot of wasted data, right? Except when it's not, how do you know which and was really important? I need you to do this and that. Those are two tasks, okay? And other people use and, and it's just splicing a sentence. They're just doing a run on, okay? And um, my favorite phrase with this, and other things that you have to pick up when you start diagnosing media, is uh, you know the Oxford comma or the Oxford pause, okay? Let's go eat, comma, grandma, okay? Take that out, let's go eat grandma, okay? I'm not up for eating my grandmother. So those are two totally different phrases, but to a computer system doing transcription, they're no different. So transcription isn't enough. Matter of fact, it kind of leads to a little bit of overload. You have to get to topics and sentiments. That's how you build actions out of text. If I gave you a transcript of everything you've said on a phone or a video in the last year, you'd be like, gee, thanks, throw it in the trash can. I don't need it. Because you can't search that, you can't operate on it, you can't work on the topics that are involved in that. But if I'm able to pull a topic out and know what the topic is supposed to be, and I can pull out intent or sentiment analysis, they're, they're two vectors of the same discipline in the AI world, now we get to get working on something, right? I've got an action, and I've got a result or an intent. That's information, isn't it? That's interesting. What if you were doing a self-review on how you managed your teams or worked over the last couple of years and you wanna go look for conflicts in your conversations and see how you handled them? What if you wanna go back and look and see where things really went well? How did I take this complicated project that I was working on and drive it to a design decision and get it funded so quickly, I did it in like a month, and that's usually a four or five month process in my business. Don't you wanna be able to go topically look at that? You don't wanna look at every data point, you wanna go look at what did the communication flow look like? So, and I don't like the word again, but take that to the video level, right? Now we've got a whole lot more information in there. Um, facial recognition, just to give you an idea, the Chinese have the world's best facial recognition right now. 
they are able to, after training on your particular face and image, they only need about one fourth of your earlobe in order to get a 95% match, okay? That's a shockingly low amount of visual data to identify somebody. It's really impressive the technology is working on there, but things that we can do in here, I think are more important to businesses are things like engagement analytics. How would you like to conduct a video meeting and know at the end, were the participants engaged in what you were doing or what your uh, uh, conversation was about? What if that drove your decisions on who you invited in the future back to those meetings? What if you had unnecessary participants? How many people have ever been invited to a meeting that when finished went, I had no purpose to be there? Okay, what if we could just get half of those out? Just half of those, free your life up. And you know what? I'll pretend I'm the employer. I'm a super nice guy. Not only the half of those meetings you don't have to go to, I'm not even gonna ask you to work that full half. I'm gonna give half of it to you to do whatever you wanna do. The other half belongs to me for other stuff. Does that sound like a good deal? Well, we gotta go through the data first, right? Okay. There's no point in exposing all of this data without looking at what the productivity enhancements can be at the end. We're so early, the list is somewhat undefined. However, the few case examples I just gave you are already coming into play in this space. The other piece of this is what's going on inside your business that's special to your business. There's a, a, another interest of intent on keywords. So if I am working with you and we're in a professional organization and your project was not as good as I wanted it to be and I say, yep, yeah, I need you to get better on this, right? That's a very clear phrase, I need you to get better. Okay, what does that mean? How do we analyze it? How does that data make anything out of sense? Now, that could happen in a professional organization just about anywhere, but what happens when that's said in a doctor's office or in a hospital. I need you to get better. How different is that meaning? It's dramatic. And the English language has so many words in it, proper use of the word so. Other languages have fewer words, so the meanings are actually more diverse than even the English language. So we gotta focus on productivity, but we've gotta know what it means and how it works. So let's talk about the journey here. Today, we know just about nothing on what happens in our communications between all of our colleagues today. It only know what happened while we were right there. And my version of it could be different than your version of it. And we could both be right. So that's it. So metadata is all we have. Now, let's pretend that the world decided all of a sudden that workers would start bringing their own devices to work People would start working remotely, mobily. Some people would work from home. Maybe not everybody goes into a desk every day. And, and we can all pretend that that's happened, right? Now, what do I know as a business? I know that you are on the phone for two hours and I knew that you were on a video for 44 minutes. I have no idea what you did. You could have been making faces with your kid on the video. There's no insight to that information. So worker productivity is a key issue, and, and let, let's be honest, we're kind of freewheeling it right now, okay? And in an economy that's booming for tech talent and other professional talent, it's probably okay. There'll be a cycle where it's important that other people know how productive you actually are. So we gotta move past uh, data. So the next step is transcription. Transcription engines are pretty good at this point in multiple languages across multiple dialects. So look for that exposure of information next. The next layer on that is topics. Okay, we talked about that earlier. You can transcribe everything, but it's too much to work with. We gotta get down to topics. The next layer is intent. It's close cousin sentiment analysis. And then you can start to get into the video side of things. Presence detection, facial recognition, uh, sentiment analysis on video, participation analysis, eye contact presence, et cetera. A lot of data up here, right? So we're sitting here in the middle of the big data conference. Let's talk a little bit about how much data it is. And I'm just for 
visual purposes, these little pie slices I'm about to show you aren't anywhere near to scale. Because the metadata of what's in a typical transcription of a call or in a video is so little compared to the information in the media itself. So I run a communications company's platform. There's about 400 rows of data for every phone call, chat interaction, or the start and stop of a video meeting. That's the information I give you today. It's in our portal, you can download it, you can look at it, you can analyze it, you can say this person's on the phone this much, this person's in video this much, this is how much this screen's in the front. It doesn't tell you about anything inside that media, right? This is just a little bit of data. So let's open up the first amount. Let's take the first one as 750 times its original data. So the typical phone conversation is two and a half minutes between two people. The average rate of speech is 150 words per minute. Voila, 750. Now I have 750 words. That's 750 data points that didn't exist before. So I have increased my data set by 750x. Okay, we're just getting started. Okay, sentiment or intent, for every word, or really the lexicon, there's basically eight vectors of potential sentiment associated with it, and they each receive a score, and then you analyze a set of words together, and you decide what the sentiment or intent is for that segment of speech, okay? So, to be clear, uh, when we talk about sentiment analysis, when somebody is angry, they're typically speaking louder and faster and they make mistakes in their uh, word choices. So we know that by scoring each of those words and then the, uh, the, the rhythm of those words and the speed at which they're speaking, I can take all that information together and I can deduct a sentiment of that phone call. And all these emotions have there, but understand that there's about eight vectors we score on and we put all that information. So take that transcription, multiply it by eight. Okay, so we're pushing a lot of data now. This is a lot of information to have out there. Let's take further on that you run a call center or something like that inside your organization, people that interface with outside customers. You may want to train on this data later to ML and other applications or in your own systems, things along those lines. So you actually want to store this data more than just today, more than just while it's happening. So now we're creating a lot more information than we had before. So I'm gonna throw on video here, and I'm just gonna simply say the way we did the analysis of data points in a video is we look at basically 10 second frame increments. And in that 10 seconds, that's just generally people don't do a lot during 10 seconds in a video conference because sometimes that's a good 30 or 40 seconds of it. Uh, we're able to create information outside of that. But as you saw earlier, we are looking at a lot more information. We've got the facial recognition going on, attention, uh, all the things that you would find in video that are, that are absent from the voice, plus the transcription, plus the sentiment, plus now sentiment analysis on body, not just words. What if I told you we're not far away from having reasonable accuracy, not life or death accuracy, but reasonable accuracy, on detecting when the sentiment of the words being spoken and the body language don't match. Useful, right? A little creepy, but useful. But aren't we doing that all the time ourselves? Isn't that something that we're working on inside our heads? Aren't you looking for body language and whether people are matching their body language to their words when you're engaged in a video conversation or another type of conversation? Of course, we're doing that already this is just another way of exposing that information and memorializing it because really it's the historics of this information and the grand data sets that can be created that can change how an organization operates. So, again, I'll work on that. Multiply these all out. And for what we store one record today, we believe that exposing the information that we listed about the communication methods we just talked about is about 792 million to one. Okay, so you're storing one of today, what you will probably end up storing 792 million in the next few years. 
Is that big enough? Is it good enough? Does that count as big data? Does that generate the kind of numbers that go, whoa, I'm not talking about a structured model anymore. I'm not talking about pure sum, add, divide analytics in there. I need AI and insights in order to work on these kind of data sets, right? Because that's a whole lot of data. The biggest problem with that data is today, most of it is siloed. So while these engines that I just described exist in the consumer market, emerging in the business market, when you silo them out, they're not quite as interesting from each other. If you got transcription on one side, but you got topic words in a completely separate store, and they're not really merged data sets, it really becomes hard to extrapolate where you're going with that information. So we have to start thinking of things more in groupings in here and less in stovepipe analytics in here, because these AI engines that help us with facial recognition, uh, body language, everything else, they're gonna change, they're probably gonna improve, and they're probably gonna change vendors. So the one that works really well today may not be the one you're using down, down, the, down the line when, when you found that you need a different engine. You operate in different countries, so you need different linguistic engines. Maybe your transcription engine isn't the same across your entire company. So all sorts of possibilities in there. We architect our system like this. We put the data together, but we allow for any AI engine to be inserted into the data stream. And that's, that's how we're combining those data sets. Because as we mentioned, what is being put together right now is larger than any data set that came out of your communications platform in the past. I mean, it's literally the phone was up, the phone was down, and I called somebody. That's it. Look at the call log in your iPhone. That's not what you did. It's just kind of a who and where. It's like saying, you know, it's like keeping the ticket that you took on your vacation to Switzerland and deleting all your photos. Like it's almost not part of the event itself. Throw that across all the modes of communication that we're talking about, social media, throw that times again, the number of relationships that we have in our business world compared to our personal world. And we're talking about a set of data and a set of information now that we have to manage differently than we did in the past. You can't just fly all over to different apps and have stovepipes and things along there. You also can't go to a vendor and have your data locked up. And you can't have your data hidden from you. You have to have people that are willing to do this kind of technology, but not grasp and hold on to the underlying information forever. It needs to be open, accessible, and in there. And I, I, I don't, I completely despise these pricing models that I see with a lot of the vendors that, that, that I've had to use in the past few years where it's almost free to put something in and it's like eight X as much to pull it back out. That's not a good model, is it? So, so you know, this concept of data freedom, I think is key and important. So we talked about how much this, this produces now. We have to have the systems and the processes and the vendors that are ready to deal with that. How many people in the last few minutes maybe changed your mind about how much data are around business communications. So let's see if I reach you, that was my goal. It's okay, if I didn't, I'll keep working on it. And how many of you believe there's business value in analyzing what goes on inside communications in order to help people be more productive, to serve customers better, or to, in, to improve a business process? How many people agree on that? Okay, good hands on that. The good news here is the old way of doing this was a manager would snoop on you. They go to IT and get access to your email or read your chat logs or potentially we would record all the phone calls going in and out of a call center and listen to it. Or maybe it's an employee that we suspect is misbehaving and we're doing even more listening and recording. What I like about the potential future here is with AI and big data is we can get away from human subjectivity on humans 
and we can get to a little more machine learning and AI improvement and self-improvement. What if that data was available to you and it was part of your way of improving your job? You need to spend a little less time doing this and a little more time doing that. Most people want to be more efficient in what they do. We walk usually the shortest distance between two points when we're busy. When we're running, we do something else. But when we're walking and we're trying to get somewhere, we do that. So I think the opportunity is huge here. Um, in closing, I want to open up just for a minute for some Q&A. So I know there's a microphone around here. We got about five minutes for it. Um, this, is, this is the size portfolio that my company operates on. So when we talk about all those data sets there, you can see how many modes of communication, how many people that we're interacting with in a typical business on there. We have businesses that do 50, 60, 70 million minutes a day of chat, voice, and video. And, and, and they are now pulling insights out of that data. And I think really, we've just barely started, just barely started on that front. That's a wrap. I'll be here um, for a few minutes. If you have anything you want to discuss uh, personally that you don't want your question out in the open, uh, do appreciate your time. Enjoy this show. Amazing amount of information here to learn. Thank you very much.